I hope that you're grasping the beautiful compression that poetry imposes on a poet to reach for the best possible few words and the best possible combination of those words to evoke the maximal level of readerly emotion. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today, I want to gush about, I mean, talk about Sickle by Ruth Lilligraven, translated from the Norwegian by May Britt Ackerholt. It's available in English in this beautiful, slim, handsome hardcover from Seagull Books. Last year, a little while after I posted my video on recent Nobel laureate Jan Fassa's trilogy, the translator commented on the video, Maybrit Ackerholt, and she was so kind and had such great things to say, and we ended up getting into a conversation, during the course of which led me to her translation of Sickle by Lilligraven. And in a few words, I knew that I had to get my hands on this book, but as I've talked about, especially in my recent Q&A number five video, that sixth sense that leads me to which book to read next hadn't kicked in until now. And it was really interesting because I was preparing to go on a trip and we bookworms know what trips mean, especially when a long train ride is involved or an airplane. This means we need to select reading material. And if you're like me, this is both fun and perilous. I kept getting these groups of candidates together and then narrowing them down to two or three. Butcher's Crossing was in the mix. First to Knox's recent publication of Jeremy Kitchen's Mr. Krabby, You Have Died, which I promise I'm getting to, was among the candidates. And just when I thought that I had my selection, and I only wanted to take one book because this was the type of family trip where we were going to be kind of go, go, go. So I couldn't really take something that was going to require tons of time and immersion. But the night before our flight, I walked into my library and I just sort of perused the spines and went over to my poetry section and was perusing those spines because I thought poetry would be something perfect to dip in and out of. And all of a sudden, sickle just jumped out at me. And I mean, that sixth sense kicked in full blast and I knew immediately, this is the book I'm supposed to take with me. On the first flight, I read the first 50 pages without taking any notes, no annotations, no post-it tabs, just getting acquainted with the structure and the content and the language. And right from the poem that's used as an epigraph, I was immediately in love. And so a little bit later in the hotel room, I reread those first 50 pages. And then I emailed May Britt Ackerholt, the translator, to let her know, hey, I've started reading the book you recommended me a year ago. You know, sorry, I'm just getting around to it, but this is something special. And so then I read it again on the plane ride back, this time in its entirety. And then after we got home and got settled and had the rest of a Saturday to just relax and recuperate, I sat on my back deck with the cool air, the falling leaves, the sounds of birds, squirrels, and even deer rustling around on the forest floor. And I read it from start to finish this time, taking copious annotations throughout and noticing so much more. And I was absolutely convinced that I had to do a video and share this with all of you. And I want to urge you to grab this book. And in fact, it is such a perfect autumn winter, like late autumn, early winter read. In other words, now. At about 136 pages of verse, 
you can read it in one sitting or you can dip in and out of it. But it also demands, or let's not say demands, it also encourages and compels rereading. It's a book to spend a few days with. I know that this time of year for bookworms is usually for cozying up with those long, dense reads. And I myself, today in fact, am about to begin my first autumn, winter, long read. But I want to encourage you to get sickle and make this a part of this season's memory fabric in your life. And I'm going to do my best in this video to convey why this book has made such an impact on me and why it's a sort of Norwegian instantiation of what the Japanese called mono no aware, which we talked about in the Tale of Genji video. That aching sadness that's beautiful and pleasurable because of its very transience. Sickle is a blend of narrative and lyric poetry that also, taken together as a whole, constitutes a novel in verse. This has precedence, of course, in Pushkin and Vikram Seth's novel in verse about San Francisco. It's about the cycle of life, the interplay of nature and the seasons and human life constantly in a cycle of birth and death and regeneration. But it's also about figuring out who we are as individuals, yet not severing ourselves from the beautiful tree of all of our families. What I didn't expect about this book, though, is that it ends up being a triumphant ode to reading and books and language, which secured me as an admirer of Sickle for life. And I know that I'll be coming back to this book again and again. Words in Sickle become seeds that give birth to language and finally produce life in new undiscovered worlds. Let me take a step back though to say that May Britt Ackerholt, the translator, the person who holds the keys to unlocking something like Sickle, for me to experience, even if I'm only experiencing the shadow of the original Norwegian within the penumbra of Ackerholt's glorious English. Ackerholt was born and bred in Norway, and she's a little different in that she translates from her original language into English, but she considers herself bi-ethnic and bilingual because she has lived with her family there in Australia for a very long time. Like I said, she's also translated Jan Fossa and especially Isbin. And she shared with me an email that she can't believe that Isbin has become as popular as he has, despite the poor English translations that we've had. And I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but during the course of speaking with Maybrit, an idea that has been suggested by many people for a direction this channel can take or a series that I could do is starting to really bloom in my mind. And so I don't think this is the last you're going to hear about Sickle, about Ruth Lillegraven, about Jan Fossa, Isben, about translating from Norwegian into English, about Maybrit Ackerholt. So we'll see what happens. Stay tuned. The story, which this isn't going to give anything away, I'll stop before the epiphany takes place. A young boy named Andre is born to a large farming family in a Norwegian village. Since he's the eldest boy, he is expected to take over the farm from his father, Svein. But he is a little different, a bit introverted. Yet he does his utmost to follow exactly in his father's footsteps. As we know from such life in the 19th century in these harsh climates, 
and this hard scrabble life. Terrible trials occur. The house burns down. They have to go and live with neighbors. His father becomes bedridden with arthritis that's twisting and gnarling his body. Siblings leave. People die. There's mourning. There's grief. But always death and rebirth. Always hope and despair. Eventually, Andra encounters the bookish Abelona, and they marry. But then several tragedies force Andra to really face who he is. There is an impasse that stops him from continuing to follow in his father's footsteps, which this fatherly emulation is all that Andra has ever known. And so in the midst of this identity crisis, is when the unexpected, at least to me, turn in the book towards the salvation through reading and books and language makes Sickle, for me, stand out from the pack of lesser-known books here to us Anglophones in America. So with all of that context, let's read through some of the stuff that struck me. Like I said, the bit of a poem that's used as the epigraph comes from Hans Borley, A Doorknob of Iron, from the book The Iceberg in 1970. And this epigraph perfectly sets the mood for Sickle, and I'm going to read it. I often remember the iron knob on the porch door at home on the croft in the forest, the gentle grip of hands, the yearning of soiled farmer's fists, had worn it thin like that of a bird's wing. With the adjective iron knob, we can almost taste the copper penny tang of the worn material. And that juxtaposition of the gentle hands and the yearning of soiled farmer's fists gives a sense of the families and generations that are passing as that iron material wears down. And then finally, the ending simile, worn down thin like that of a bird's wing, it evokes both a delicacy and flight. The image of birth, growth, and taking flight from the family nest as those generations succeed one another. It opens with an epilogue. It all fell in the fjord. The sky, the light, the mountains, blue in blue, gray in gray, wet in wet. I love when we go from the second stanza and we look from top down these three levels, the sky, the light, the mountains, and then we switch in the next stanza and we describe them with very simple adjectives. Blue and blue for the sky, gray and gray for the light, and wet and wet for the mountains. But I like how we go from this transition of color into texture, this mixing of the senses. And we get the first pair of compound adjectives, which are so beautiful here. The road, narrow curved, and rock hewn. Narrow curved and rock hewn are not split or joined by a hyphen. It's that sort of Joycean compound word. And then on the next page, we kick it up a notch with three words joined to give this compound adjective noun that evokes sound, feel, sight, and motion all in one word. But then there is also the marsh grass, the rattle rustle leaves, that's all one word, rattle, rustle, leaves, and the Sunday clouds, one word. Sunday clouds is, is more felt to be a perfect descriptor than something one can describe better than just leaving that word alone and undiminished, leaving it on its own. It, it evokes something in us that we get from, for example, Sunday morning from... Wallace Stevens. And below the ground, the seeds, small green fingers stretching and stretching through the mold, through the mold, dark mother mold. So this is our first hint here in the prologue of that great 
you know, personification of nature's gestation from embryo to infant. And this image of the seeds as small green fingers stretching up through the soil will be echoed about 120 pages later. And that dark mother mold gives us the earth as womb. I love these two lines, and you'll notice that in the first line I read, there's this C, 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 this K, K, K. And then in the next line, there's this B, 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 B. The tickling clear cold night we turn by the large birch. Father points up into the blue black above and says, look, the moon. And later the moon is described like a sickle in the sky. So normally the moon, of course, stands for the mother in literature. Here we get the notion of a sickle, which will come to stand for both the moon, which is the first memory that Andra has with his father, and also for work for the father, taking the sickle into the field. And then in the next poem from that one called Mother and Father, these are incredible compound adjectives, again, to describe the mother and the father. And it doesn't even really need my annotation. I'm only going to read the two stanzas. They are two triplet stanzas. My mother is melting sun and buttercup. My father is old spruce and soar eagle. Some of these beautiful words, these beautiful coinages, these contrivances. I don't have access to the underlying Norwegian, but just in English is so striking. It reminds me of some of the magic, some of the musicality we get from Atsir O'Reilly. This is the first image on page 10 that really stopped me in my tracks. And I literally mean that. Well, I guess I don't literally mean it because I wasn't on, you know, railroad tracks or whatever, but literally stopped me from reading and kind of forced me to close my eyes and just sort of nurse on this image for a while. This is incredible. Even if father puts the fiddle under his chin, lifts the bow, plays room dust into gold. Oh, <laughs> okay. You can see this dusty old house in the middle of a Norwegian winter with a fire roaring and the father putting this violin under his chin and starting to move the bow and stir up all the dust in the house. And you can see that the room dust is golden because of perhaps the fireplace and the candlelight. This image and the way that it is articulated here is something that you can come back to and drink from again and again. It's a stunning feat of poetic sensibility. So bravo Lillegraven and bravo Ackerholt. Here's the next one at the end of the same poem entitled Silence. The silence sits inside me, lying there, lurking in wait, as if it were another language. The notion of another language will be very important throughout the entirety of Andra's life. When we get to the passage that describes the burning down of their house and the entire something 12 people that live in the house escaping out into the refuge of the snow only to watch it burn, this particular section really caught my eye. I can only see the sparks like gilded snowflakes against the red sky. There's so much pathos in that. And I hope that you're grasping the beautiful compression that poetry imposes on a poet to reach for the best possible few words and the best possible combination of those words to evoke the maximal level of readerly emotion. And in fact, if you're used to only reading prose, short stories, essays, novels, and you can't really get into poetry, 
honestly, Sickle may be a great place to start because, again, it reads like a novel. In Andra's boyhood, he sees this rock, this really steep rock above the summer pasture, and it just stretches up towards the sky. And he says, one day I too will stand up there, feel the blood beat and the breath heave, know that I did it. Then I will have seen what there is to see. Then I can live here without longing to leave. And he will not end up climbing that rock and seeing all the world as he sets his aspirations on early in life. But through books, much, much later, he will climb even higher and see even farther. In our first great loss of a young child, we get these coinages or these sort of uh, folk idioms such as everyone knows that the smallest coffins are the heaviest. Then they must thaw the ground. Then they must hack the earth. And the coffin is so small and the body in the coffin so small. And the wind bites and the snow and the sleet bite their foreheads, their cheeks and their hands. Bite them while they dig. Bite them while they mumble their words. While they throw the earth over the coffin and leave the place, my father says, and I listen. You can feel and sense that violence and cruelty of nature as they work together to chop through this frozen Norwegian soil to bury the young body. And then later, as they are gathering post-interment, they begin to thaw until the hurt begins to drip from clothes and from beards onto the table into their beer and onto the floor and into the ground under the planks. So here we get this image of their tears sowing into the same earth as the child for whom they mourn. We get a glimpse of the Norwegian cultural mythology. Now and then those who are troll skilled recreate themselves as animals, but the worst is when wicked wood nymphs bewitch people when man merges with bear. And this merging of man and bear and the metaphor of the bear is now sort of preloaded in our minds for what is to come. And it's on Andra now to rebuild the house. And he says, I am there before sunrise. I hew and prune all that is sad. I hammer into the timber. All that is easy, I chop into the wood. And this notion of hammering his sadness into the very timber that's going into rebuilding their house, this notion of imbuing the very structure of your family's home with your own emotions from all that has happened. This is the beauty of poetry. This is that Japanese notion of mono no aware, where we are combining the sadness with beauty. There's this moment where Andra is watching these birds in the sky, and he says, and then this white singing bird wave, and bird wave is a compound, chirp, 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 and just as quickly, all quiet, these birds. And in that moment, we see and feel the quick, vibrant rush of life and the equally quick hush of death. As we move along at some point, we get the excerpt from Ecclesiastes, and there is a time for everything, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to sow, a time to reap. And this could very well have been the epigraph or a second epigraph. When Andra and Abalona finally sort of start their courtship, there's this beautiful moment where he says that I put my hands around her, swing her around until her eyes are just black strips, and she laughs and laughs until she and I disappear, become a large glowing us. Just <laughs> think about sitting down as the author, as Lilligraven, and thinking, okay, now I need to 
help the reader sense this connection and this love that links Andra and Abalona. And hitting upon the notion of swinging her round and round. And in that swirl, the two individuals dissolving into a glowing us. That's incredible. And then there's this haunting notion of the other girl. Because Abalona knows that Andra wanted Kari first. Or tried to court Kari but was rejected. And after Andra consoles Abalona and makes it clear that Abalona is the one he wants, it says that the Kari mist, this time hyphenated, Kari mist lifts. The Kari mist lifts. Speaking of the forest, it says, nor should you walk there just to walk. No, you should have a purpose, hewing, hunting, picking. So again, this, as if we don't realize it already, this is a life that just doesn't afford leisure. And then we get two pairs of compound nouns that, again, are fused together, and they're so perfect. Here, there is neither rain rustling nor troll puttering. Here, there is only saga softs and shadow sun. What a great way, again, to use the economy of the English language in this case. I'd love to know what the underlying Norwegian is. But these four words to help us, to help transport us into this Norwegian forest. Rain rustling. There is neither rain rustling nor troll puttering. And even though it's denying what the forest is like right now, Nonetheless, it evokes what normally it's like in a Norwegian forest. Normally, there's rain rustling and troll puttering. Here, in this forest, there's only saga softs and shadow sun. More beautiful poetic imagery. And then Abalona is with child. She is with child in the golden morn over the crag, in the ribbon after the ducks out on the water in the apple shining russell red. I can see that ribbon in the surface of the water after the ducks, that ribbon following behind the ducks as they're going out and moving along the water. And the, the child is not born yet, but the child is already filling and imputing itself into every part of Andra's world and he refers to it as a new little leaf on the large tree, a child I can carry out into the night, its arms around my neck and forehead against my chin. Look at the moon, I shall tell him. Look at the moon. And this is the first memory that we get from Andra, his first memory just uh, that he made with his own father. And so again, we're still seeing Andra as the emulator of his own father. But his father has long since succumbed to arthritis. And we've started getting little hints that the same thing is happening to Andra. And he finally admits to his father, There's an animal in me, I say. It's on my hands, snarls and bites, and it hurts. And I get weak. Now, father turns silent. Silence becomes a cloud out on the field. So this, the, the pain, I love that image at the end, his father turning silent, and you can almost see him turning and looking out over the field, and there's a cloud hovering, and that cloud is echoing all the pain that the father is feeling for his son to see that his son is succumbing to the same fate that he has, and it's getting... Uh, redirected, transmuted into that into nature. And despite the, the father's own fallen state at the hands of this arthritis, he says, but remember, it only hurts as much as you want it to. So take the saw, the rack, and the sickle and do your duty. Remember, you can do it all and you can be it all. This is what the father knows. The father only knows the sickle. The father only knows work. And then, inevitably, there's another 
horrible loss. And this loss, this time, becomes an abrupt signal to Andre that his life is not going to be able to follow that of his father's any longer. And we get the repeated image of the tears of the mourners following the loss and the interment of a little life. He makes the pain disappear down into the brew, down on the floor and down in the earth under the timber till the water sparkles and the moon twinkles in the room. And Andra now tries to play the fiddle. And at first there is white bird chirping all run together, compound word, and summer bird dripping. But then the bear is back around me and inside me. And of course, at this point, we know that the bear is a metaphor for the arthritis. It goes on, you, Andra, they say you've always been so strong. You'll be able to take the bear. Yes, Andra, you take him. And yes, my father killed the bear. My father killed the man killer. And my uncle killed polar bears and took the pelt for his own. This time it's literal. This time we're hearkening back to the fact that Andra's father actually killed a bear that was terrorizing the community. But I just stand here. The bear has thrust his claws into my skin and his teeth in my joints, gnaws and chews on hip and elbow, shoulder, wrist, and fingers. And boy, anybody who has dealt with arthritis will probably immediately relate to such strong, violent, intense language. And this interplay of the bear, the literal bear, and the metaphorical bear of arthritis sort of implies to us that the the bears outside of us in nature are nothing to that bear within us. The physical pain that cannot be avoided, cannot be silenced. And now the bear has all its claws in me. My feet are just lying there, and my hands, everything withers, becomes thin and brittle, like the last autumn foliage. The image of claws there, the, the bear claws being in him, also echoes the way we can see and feel his hands that are shriveling and, and gnarling, claw-like from the arthritis. And so finally, what has to happen is that Andra has to pass on his birthright. He has to pass it on to another brother who wasn't the firstborn. And in that acquiescence, that letting go, that transitioning, this is the second huge blow to Andra's identity, which is shaped and molded so after his father. It crushes Andra because the brother to whom he's transferring the ownership of the farm hasn't put in the work that he, Andra, has. And he says... It's not his heart that is plowed into the earth and carved in the timber there. And so right before part three, we get Andra at his rock bottom, his lowest point. And he is in such a deep depression, we can't even hear from him, even though he's the first person narrator of the majority of Sickle. Here we switch to Abalona, who says, now he just lies there and cannot do a thing. And so we're left at the end of part two on this horribly depressing note. But then we turn the page and we get a triumphal first line of part three. There's no punctuation, by the way. There's hardly any punctuation in the whole book. It just simply says, then a book arrives. And so, of course, the fact that the turning point hinges on books and reading and language or discovery of life through books, of course, just lit me up, like I said. Andra says, I push aside the bear and then I speak again. So our bodies, they decay. Our joints, our bones become withered and brittle. But for the most part, our 
minds and our tongues, our mouths can continue far beyond what our bodies, our, the rest of our physical body can bear. And at first, Andre is really put off from this book that his brother sends him from America. He says, doesn't he know that I can't get myself to England or America or anywhere else? And I have never read books. It's you, meaning Abalona, who's always reading. Of course, as we know, and as Emily Dickinson has made so clear, we can, through books, we can travel anywhere. But soon I say the new words, as light as aspen leaves inside myself. And aspen leaves is a compound word used together. But soon I say the new words, as light as aspen leaves inside myself. That's gorgeous. I keep turning the pages, the sheets as thin as morning mist. I love this delicacy, this reverence for the delicacy. But it's also literal because as we come to find out, it is a Norwegian English dictionary. It's a bilingual dictionary. And eventually he tells Abalona, oh, I feel fine, I say, now that I can look across, now that I can see what there is to see, now that I can see the world as infinitely big as it is, now I can live here. So that echoes again, like I said, way earlier on page 15, when he thought that he needed to surmount that Everest of that high rock and look out over the world in order to be able to be okay with living where he is. Now he's done that, but through reading. And now that we've shifted from such a dark and cruel and sad place in life to this brightness of hope. Listen to how the language modulates. Just weeks later, I sit at the sunny wall reading about a botanist in Tahiti. I see Odman's family fowl, so foully powly happy, and spring rowdy reeling and roosting around. You can hear that almost nursery rhyme sing-song musicality coming out. He says, I read, and it is all so fine and smooth between my fingers. But then eventually we switch back to the perspective of Abalona. And she says, I don't hear, don't understand. All these words, the words that Andra is learning, the English words and the Tahitian words, all these words folding out from the book pages like larvae from the cocoons take off and flutter around the room more and more of them. I love this image of all these new words he's learning, all the stuff he's getting from books, taking flight and unfurling and filling the room. It is hard to understand that he lies there totally silent one day, only to talk and talk the next. He, who has been so high and low and everywhere, but who never wanted to open a book. Now, after the dictionary arrived, all he wants is to bury himself in the books, now it is no longer possible for me to reach him, and I miss him, miss us. So what's happening is that she is coming to a place where she now has to grapple with and, and learn this new Andra, this new identity that he's discovering. She knows the Andra who was merely riding the coattails of his father and just emulating his father until the several different blows in his life totally precluded that path from continuing on. And that can be hard to deal with, especially in young love, where they courted each other just briefly, got married very young. They're sort of getting to know each other during the marriage. It can often be very difficult to have a notion of somebody who's that close to you, but then they sort of take a new track rediscover themselves. And towards the end, we get to a poem called Egg in the Air. And it's just such a beautiful moment. Andra and Abalona are forging a new branch in this metaphor of the great tree we get for the entire family. And this branch is constructed of what his brother Knut, who sent him the dictionary, will call their English. This brief poem where 
there's this turning point because when Abalona first talks about being taken aback by this reinvigorated Andra who just wants to read and read and he's becoming distant from her in a different way than the distance that was felt when he was in his deep depression, you're kind of wondering which way this is going to go. And happily, they both discover or Abalona rediscovers the beauty and power of reading but also the discovery of a new language and made very much their own, according to Knut. And right at the end of part three, we get an echo from that prologue. It says, till small green fingers begin to stretch upward towards the light. The more I read this and the third time I read it, I really could see just how designed, how carefully designed the structure of this book is. She's doing more than just telling a story. She's, in a sense, telling a story about how to tell a story. And finally, I didn't become my father, nor my grandpa either. I am who I am. That moment of self-discovery. And then triumphantly, as we imagine him there in a chair or in a bed with his body taken over by this arthritis, but yet happy with his books and together in that bliss with his wife. Oh, I say, I see this rock I never climbed. Do you see it? Talking to Abalona. Do you see me? I can do it all. I can be it all. Now I begin to climb finger by finger, foot by foot, and my body breathes and beats and throbs, strong and tough like then his earlier years. It breathes and beats until I stand there. Look out on the village, the land and the world, on all there is to see. Then I rise and fly upward towards the sky, towards the sky. So now the books have developed his imagination such that he can go far beyond his original youthful and now paltry goal of climbing that rock, the literal rock. And an image that we are left with towards the very end is an image that perfectly captures how I feel by the time I get to the end of this book. And it says, such a silver shimmering day, stardust in the fjord. And silver shimmering is one word, as is stardust. Such a silver shimmering day, stardust in the fjord. I hope that I have been able to convey at least a little bit of what I get out of reading a book like Sickle and how this book just so perfectly mirrors our current season and how it celebrates literature, reading, books, language, translation. Please do yourself a favor and go get a copy of Sickle by Ruth Lilligraven, translated by May Britt. Ackerholt, out from Seagull Books.